Hey, welcome to Ohio State Buckeyes Live, episode 71. I am filling in right now. I'm Kevin Noon of BuckeyeGrove.com. I'm joined by Tony Gerdeman of Buckeye Scoop, and we have plenty to talk about. Steve Hellwagon of Bucknuts will join us here shortly. Uh, the Big Ten is back, and uh, not a moment too soon, if you, if you ask me, Tony. No, not a moment too soon if you ask the players who want to play for a, a national championship in the college football playoffs as well. And it's uh, I'm not saying it's putting the, the cart before the horse, but there's been so much CFP talk with all of this that uh, you almost don't, don't forget about the season. And when we got to talk to Justin Fields and Jonathan Cooper today, it was clear that the, the the playoff talk is nice, but now it is time to focus on the season. And it seemed like a pretty focused group. And Talked to those two today. Talked to Ryan Day and Gene Smith and Christina Johnson a couple days ago. So yeah, there is plenty to talk about, and 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 but we also get to talk about football because it's back. And I, for one, to, I, Kevin, I don't know how you feel about it. I'm pretty happy football is back. It makes watching football that is going on now better, <laughs> even though the, even though the football may not yet be good, you, you still get to watch it, and it's not like there's there's no anger or uh, any of those feelings you're just like hey eventually i'll be able to cover teams and and won't just be looking at all of this spitefully which is nice that's a nice change it, it really is and we can get into the brass tacks of what uh the agreement is in terms of the big 10 the structure of the season but you you'd mentioned that we had the opportunity to talk to justin fields and uh, jonathan cooper today and one of the biggest things that stood out to me is when justin fields was talking about it not really being a sacrifice, not being able to go out and go to the parties or hang out with people, assuming outside of the program, outside of that circle, because they've worked so hard to get to this point. They feel that it's such a, a special team that has limitless potential that it's not really a sacrifice giving up on just a couple of months of, of whatever frivolity, you know, Maybe the stuff that we enjoyed the most when we were college students, very unathletic college students, mind you, to be able to go out there and compete for this situation that they that I mean, a petition of 300,000 signatures plus whatnot. I mean, national media appearances by both Fields and Coop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That really stood out to me. And, and what what kind of stood out to you on that call? Well, when. Fields was asked, do you think your petition had an effect? He said, yeah, I think it had an effect. I don't think it was the only effect, the only thing that had an effect. And then he added, but even if it didn't have an effect, I don't care. I've got football back. And so it's it's been interesting to see how they kind of just turn the corner and are, are ready because you know, this is something they've been wanting since they walked off the field against Clemson last year, and it was taken away from them. They've got it back. And uh, the focus just from from Coop and Fields was was impressive, and uh, the, the everything that they've been through just in the last you know few months. And as Brian Day said, it's it's brought the entire team closer together. I from what we saw, what we've seen with Fields, he said he feels like you, know, you go on national television and you talk about wanting to bring the, the college football season back. He's like I. Now I feel like I can talk to anybody on the team. I can bring this entire team together. Last year, he wasn't necessarily a guy who would go and, and reach out to the defense or grab the defense you know, by the collar and, and give him a good shaking. But now he feels like he can talk to anybody. He feels like he is a leader of this team, uh, the entire team. And it, it, it's been uh, interesting to see how it, – it'll be interesting to see how well teams in the Big Ten have grown from this and – see who has grown and who hasn't. And it sure seems like Ohio State is one of those who has certainly grown and you know they're, they're closer to each other. Ryan Day is, uh, you know, just if, once you get everything back that you've been fighting for, now now you've got what you want and now you can go and, and reach those goals. And uh, they, they sure seemed upbeat about it today. I want to say hi to Roger Smith here on the Super Chat, and I want to welcome in Steve Hellwagon of Bucknuts. We've been just talking about uh, our call today with uh, Justin Fields and Jonathan Cooper, obviously on the heels of the big news of the Big Ten coming back, October competition, weekend of the 23rd, 24th. You know, Steve, maybe your, you know, your opening thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, guys, sorry for my tardiness. I had to run an errand here that could not be uh, put off at the last minute, unfortunately. Um, 
very excited, I think, as everybody is, that there's going to be college football in the Big Ten this year. I was unable to be on the call this morning with the players, so I'll I'll uh, leave uh, you guys to discuss their upbeatedness. I'm sure that they're very happy. Uh, obviously, Justin Fields, uh, you know, going for such big things personally and also to kind of redeem themselves after last year and how it all ended up. So uh, I'm sure they're very ecstatic about the news and ready to get to work. It sounded like listening to Ryan Day's uh, call-in show yesterday that they're not going to be able to get into full pads until September the 30th when they begin daily testing, which is still 12 days away, but it gives them a solid three, three and a half weeks, whatever, to prepare before the first game. And uh, they're going to continue to practice, I believe, 20 hours a week now. So that's good news in terms of preparation. And uh, certainly, I think, you know, again, uh, you couldn't be any lower than the low that we had when we were finding out there was no football. And then, of course, we all tracked the story as it as it went in the weeks that followed. Uh, you know, the parents protesting and the lawsuit from Nebraska's players and everything else that happened. You had people like Clay Travis really banging the drum for this and President Trump picking up the phone and calling the commissioner to kind of pull out any other obstacles that were in the way as best as they could. And uh, thankfully, they went to back to the to the meeting rooms and the drawing boards and the Zoom calls and did more research and were able with the fast uh, result testing to turn this thing around and get the car going back going in the right direction. So that's kind of my long and short of it. Uh, we've talked about for weeks how awful it was, and and now it's like the dark clouds have been lifted up from over our head. Let me ask you guys real quick. Uh, one month ago, yesterday, Randy Wade uh, posts the the ticket picture on his Twitter account saying, "I'm coming to Chicago." If he doesn't go to Chicago, do we have football right now? Go ahead, Kev. I'm just gonna say, I um. I really think that kind of got one of, I mean, there were a lot of things in motion there, but I think it really did get a lot of people motivated. Uh, Big Ten fans were losing their mind one way or the other. Players were getting antsy one way or the other, but I think it kind of united the clans, if you will. If we're if we're going to talk about from Braveheart and the Highlanders and, the, and everything else, everybody really was able to kind of focus behind that. I think if you look at Randy Wade having the, the the protest in Chicago and the lawsuit put in place by the Nebraska players, I think those were two of the most important events. It may be even more so than the petition in my mind, because I think those were the most tangible, real events to show that there was a unified front that people were not going to go away, that this just wasn't going to be a case of people saying, well, these these men and women lead universities. They must know better than us. Well, we'll just go on watching Sunbelt football. I think that, I mean, I think that both of those were, were just critically important to this process. Yeah, my, my two cents on that, and again, forgive the pounding in the background. We're having a, a floor put in here at the house, unfortunately, uh, right as I'm doing this, but um, my my thought is definitely Randy Wade. I mean, he was the first person kind of um, with a voice that came out and said, no, we don't accept this. And obviously, I mean, there was very little the, the athletes could do, uh, you know, during the summer, there wasn't much that they could do to, to get it turned around. But the parents were under no obligation to anybody to keep quiet. And uh, he said the coaches have their contracts. They couldn't really speak out against their employers or the conference. And uh, the athletes had their scholarships, and they, they couldn't risk that by being, uh, you know, by speaking out. I think the, the lawsuit by the Nebraska players was huge because it started to air some of the dirty laundry that the Big Ten didn't want out there, and people were able to start poking holes in their story. And uh, they didn't want that. Obviously, that was uh, that's they they hold on to their secrets, you know, with a death grip in the Big Ten, the, the schools, in the conference. There's a lot of uh, 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 a lot of things that they don't want out there publicly, and a lot of it because they're in competition 
with the ACC and the SEC for television contracts and how much money can they squeeze out of, you know, Fox or ESPN, you know, to, to maximize every dollar. So that's important to them is that they keep the, the secret sauce, the recipe to that hidden a lot of times. But uh, I think those two things are very important. Uh, I think just starting to see high school football games being played with no problem in the state of Ohio. Uh, they weren't being played in Illinois, and even Pritzker, the governor there, said if other, I'm paraphrasing, if other states want to put their kids at risk and risk their lives, that's good for them. We're not going to do it. That was one that kind of you know was was a crazy take. And then um, the NFL has gone ahead. Like last night, we saw the Bengals play the Browns, you know, uh, in Cleveland. And when you have 20,000 people at Notre Dame over the weekend to watch them play Duke and Louisville's hosting a game, West Virginia's hosting a game, Cincinnati, uh, Pittsburgh hosted a game, and Cincinnati is going to host a game this coming Saturday, and yet you're sitting here as the Big Ten, Ohio State, Indiana, Illinois, Penn State, Michigan, and you can't play. You're kind of like the six-year-old saying to your mom, well, all the other kids are outside playing. Why can't I play? And the only answer is because I told you so, which, you know, I've used it myself. It was used on me when I was a kid. There's no real good reason for it. It's because I told you so. And that was how flimsy the Big Ten's uh, argument was about this. But I give them credit. Uh, the resolve, I think, of Christina Johnson cannot be uh, undersold on this and Gene Smith. And as our sources indicated, there were donors to Ohio State, the flagship program, in the Big Ten that said, no, you need to go to bat and fight for this because Ohio State's got a team that can win the national championship, and we have all worked too hard to let that go by the wayside. So I think Ohio State deserves credit for being on the front forefront of that. I think Gene Smith also, when talking about the, the increase in testing, allowing the possibility of the season happening, he also mentioned the television partners which goes along with kind of what Steve was saying and the, the amount of money that uh, was still on the table for the Big Ten allowing this comeback to happen. I also wonder, my personal theory is Fox saw one week of just Big 12 football and was like, no, we need the Big Ten back. We can't just air Big 12 football. And, of course, the Big 12 isn't going to play the Sun Belt every single week and they aren't going to go O for every single week. But Fox needed more than just the Big 12, and, and they also probably – push some things. But I think Randy Way just showed people like you don't have to we don't have to accept this. Like you can kind of put up a fight and and then the Nebraska players ran with it. And I, I it's just been interesting to watch because I you know when the Big Ten said there was no football, I mean we I, I don't think we kind of expected it to be in October. Then you know like you I I'm thinking okay well what do we do until camp will start in December. You know, how do we get how do we make content from August to December and, and lead up to football camp? And and then, of course, uh, it turns out all of the content we needed to do was just cover all of the uh, the drama and then eventually camp starts. Well, you're, you're right about about the date. I mean, and we kind of went from thinking this might start once once the tide had turned. October 10th seemed to be the date. Mm -hmm. Then it was October 17th. The 24th crept in, but everybody was really hoping for the 17th, and it ends up being the, 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 the 23rd, 24th, eight games over eight weeks, and then the plus one model. But a little bit of a change, well, not a little bit, a, a huge change where you will still have your championship game, East and West one will play each other, but then you'll also have two versus two, three versus three, all the way down to seven versus seven. And reportedly, reportedly Jim Harbaugh is a guy who came up with his idea or was the one who really – really push for it. I mean, it's it's an interesting schedule, but they don't allow themselves much wiggle room, if, no wiggle room with games every week, no open weeks. You know, God forbid if you get into the red zone with a 7.5% 7, 5, 7 .5 positivity rate and you get shuttered for a week plus, um, it sure would have been a lot easier to do uh, 12 games over 16 weeks or 10 games over 14 weeks. Um, but we're at we are where we are. You know why Jim Harbaugh was spearheading this, right? He'll finally get to go to Indianapolis in December as like the the third team in the East against the third team in the West. So congrats to him for getting that game in in the uh, in Lucas Oil Stadium. That'll be great for him. I wouldn't be surprised. Do you guys? Maybe this thing it stays this way every year. 
where they have this championship week every year. I mean, I, I think it's a pretty neat idea and it gives a, uh, it creates more inventory for the television partners. It gives teams that won't be going bowling all, almost uh, a bowl, uh, not, not quite a bowl game, but a 13th game. I, I wonder if there will be a, a move to make this permanent. I don't know that it's possible, but I, I love the idea. I think it's pretty cool. You got any thoughts on that, Steve? Yeah, I think it would be kind of cool. Uh, I'm not sure how you would do it under the current uh, scheduling structure, whereas you have uh, just the, the the division champions right now get to play the extra game. Um, that would be kind of uh, <clears throat> kind of a fun thing uh, to to have these games kind of booked on the fly. I have not heard. Um, my assumption was that two through seven would all play at campus sites. I don't know if they're going to ta- flip a coin or three east and three west or whatever. It would make sense. <coughs> uh, well, I was going to say to do it at the largest stadiums to maximize the revenue, but there's probably not going to be any fans. So scratch that idea. But, yeah, I can't imagine they're going to play more than just – I mean, maybe they'll have a day game at the stadium and then, you know, of course, no crowd. You don't really need to – uh, or limited crowd, you don't need to empty and fill up the stadium or whatever. But uh, I don't know. I, I think it's a neat idea. Is it going to go beyond this year? I don't know. I mean, if you stay with a 12 game regular season, you'd have to, you'd only be able to schedule 11 games then. And, and what comes out? A non conference game so that you can play uh, an extra bonus game at the end? I, I don't know. So there's a lot asked of the players anyway. I can't imagine going to a 13 game regular season for everybody. I mean, you could do it as a jamboree style. You wouldn't be able to get all seven there, but they are talking about using more Fridays. You could do a situation of where you do a like a like a four and an eight on Friday, and then you do a, a twelve, a four and an eight on Saturday. You get five in there, and then you know if you're Rutgers, Maryland, or whoever, you know, just be happy that you're along for the ride. I don't, I don't know. I mean. It, it, it'll it'll be interesting to see how that all works out. I think it is a tremendous idea for this year. Uh, granted, I'm also the same person that hates the all-time DH in, in Major League Baseball, but they're saying well, it's only a 60-game season, so let's you know let's just let's just give it a shot. And you know that old Rob Manfred doesn't he doesn't care. He's going to push it through. Hell, he's trying to push through this everybody getting into the playoffs thing moving forward. So uh, I, I, I digress on that, but um, you know, getting back to just Ohio state in, in general, Sean Wade, Randy uh, or Sean Wade and Wyatt Davis both announced that they're coming back. They're opting in. Uh, you see Micah Parsons on social media talking about maybe having the desire to do that. Rashad Bateman, the receiver at was at Minnesota talking about coming back. Um, everybody's getting their players back except uh, Jim Harbaugh's team, who who seems to keep losing players even as as things are looking up for the conference. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what that speaks to. I think the quarterback leaving, I think he saw the handwriting on the wall that he wasn't going to be uh, the starting quarterback. So I think that's why he was in the mix to, to compete for it and maybe just decided he wasn't going to compete for it or whatever. I don't know, but that was interesting. But, yeah, some of the other guys figured to play. You know, Nico Collins was one of their top wide receivers. So maybe he's got a personal reason. Uh, There are some NFL players that aren't playing this year for various reasons, some Major League Baseball players that aren't playing uh, who opted out as well. So I don't know what to make of that. Um I, it, it, the only thing I could say is it, it it's just not the family type atmosphere that people portray it to be at the University of Michigan. But for me not to be involved in that scene, it's hard for me to say that. Um, so I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, getting these guys, if they want to come back and accept, you know, what the season is for what it is, uh, that's great. I think that can only be good for college football. So hopefully uh, we get as many of them to come back and play. And obviously for Ohio State uh, to, to get Sean Wade back is just tremendously important uh, because you figure he's going to have a great year at cornerback. He's poised to have an amazing year, his contract year basically, uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to get uh, into 
the NFL. And Wyatt Davis, uh, he was a top 10, top 15 pick on a lot of draft boards. And, you know, for him to come all the way back from California, he would basically moved home. And uh, for him to come back from California, that says a lot as well. And, you know, Justin Fields probably made a phone call or two and said, hey, man, I need you. You know, <laughs> I mean, if many more of those offensive line and, linemen had opted out, could you have blamed Justin Fields for not not wanting to play? But uh, he's got his whole crew back, it seems. Uh, everybody's available, so that's going to be good. And, uh, you know, I just think uh, each passing day, it's September the 18th, and we're just counting down the days until October 23rd, 24th. Uh, I don't know if we'll see a schedule today or perhaps Saturday, Sunday, Monday, hard to say. <laughs> But, uh, you know, my, my expectation is we might get that Friday night Illinois game as the opener anyway and uh, and go from there. But uh, I think it's curious what's going to happen with the Michigan game, guys. Is it going to be played in the middle or do you save it until December 12th, the last regular season game, and just hope everybody's still eligible and able to play at that time? Uh, there, the, the Michigan game, uh, I know there's, there's rumblings that – I've seen rumblings that it could be the first game of the season, which would um, I'm sure create a bunch of buzz. But I, I don't need it. To, I don't need it then. I don't need it right then. Uh, g- getting back to Michigan real quick, I did see defensive end Quiddy Pay is opting back in. I believe the Dylan McCaffrey thing is so strange though because he is set to graduate in December, so he could stay with Michigan this year, graduate, and then transfer wherever he wants. Regardless, like he is basically just quitting on Michigan and it's like, I don't want to be here anymore. And to me, that's that's very odd. It's not like he is transferring now so that he can find some place in his next couple of weeks and then not have to sit out next year or whatever that he can just go ahead and play next year. It's like he's he wants <laughs> apparently wants nothing to do with Michigan. And I think they're going to need more than one quarterback as they normally do. Joe Milton, likely the starter there, has maybe thrown five or ten passes in his career. I don't know. And but but as we've seen, the longer a quarterback is with Jim Harbaugh at Michigan, the worse they get. And so maybe Dylan McCaffrey, he, he's expended all of his uh, Wolverine quarterbacking skills because he's been there what now three years. And Joe Milton, maybe being one year younger, has more potential. And we'll see. Um, I think now you have the opportunity because there are no makeups. Now you have the opportunity to have Michigan at the end of the season because it's no different than having it in the middle or having it whenever because now it's all a crapshoot. There's no way to fix anything in the schedule. So you may as well just have it where it belongs, last game of the regular season, and deal with it then. I, I don't think you need to gussy it up or have it anywhere else or have it at the start of the season to create this big buzz. Hey, look, the Big Ten is back. You can do that with Michigan and Penn State or Ohio State and Penn State or Michigan and Wisconsin, something like that. You don't need to uh, throw the whole wad out there right at the right at the start. So, um, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I talked to a buddy at the network who touched, touched upon a lot of the points that Tony just made there that you don't have any flexibility, so there's no reason to be trying to play it early hoping to play it later because you, the dominoes don't fit at that point. So I'm hearing that it would be the last game of the season. Obviously, Fox, in terms of how the, the right package works, gets the first pick. So I can tell you that, you know, mm-hmm. Gus and Joel and, and Jenny would be calling that game. And, uh, you know, it would it certainly would be something playing it in, mid, in mid-December. in uh, mid Question was asked about how this schedule may look compared to other schedules. Purdue's AD came out and said that this schedule would be pulled out of schedule 1.0. He didn't use that term, but I am just for the sake of keeping things easy. With schedule 2.0 being the 10-game schedule, which added a road trip to Purdue. So cross that Purdue game off the list. So my understanding would be it would be the six six divisional games and then two of the three um, non-conference or non-divisional games with at Illinois – home against Nebraska, home against Iowa. And my belief would be that it would not Iowa would be the game that would go. The game that I would like to see open the season most would be Nebraska coming here. The two teams, with apologies to Iowa, Iowa was, was part of the three-team vote as well, but the two teams that seem to work the hardest 
for the, to bring football back, having to face off against each other week one, this this huge bromance between these two programs on social media and everything, and then you put them out there to go in the, in that first week. I mean, I, I already have about 20 stories pre-written in my mind for that one. Do you think there's any chance the Big Ten will do that, knowing the storylines that it will create, though? No. You think there's any chance that the Big Ten would set a schedule and then six days later <laughs> at all? Fair enough. Fair enough. But I, I yeah, I, I think um, create putting that narrative out there, just allowing people to run with it. It, it seems like they'd want to be as far away from that as possible. But also, um, that's me using logic. So yeah, yeah. But, but this, this big, logical situation. Yeah, this Big Ten is uh, it's hard to figure. I give them credit though. They threw people and time at this thing and wrestled it to the ground and studied it. They, they were like, I don't know who a very deliberate golfer would be, uh, Brooks Kepka or somebody, Bryson DeChambeau, studying the putt from every angle for about three and a half minutes before they hit it. And uh, when they finally did hit it, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give them credit. I don't know that they made it, but they, they lipped it out. They made a very good effort. So, um I'm not giving them much credit, but uh, they're going to have they're going to do a lot to redeem themselves. I think in the eyes of a lot of people, and uh, you know, just the the PR capital that was lost in this whole escapade. Uh, you know, if 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 Ohio State is able to go on, and, and speaking about the playoff, it it seems to me it's almost a ready made solution that you have the four Power Five conferences that are playing their champions should all be in this playoff unless there's some kind of crazy upset in one of the games where let's say Oklahoma state has two or three losses and they somehow beat Oklahoma or Texas in that championship game, then maybe they wouldn't go. And uh, a one loss non-champion from somewhere else might go a runner up perhaps, or something like that. But, uh, or if, or if, let's say, Ohio State would lose in the championship game, that'd be their only loss. And again, I'm just using that as a, uh, for instance, not a prediction, then maybe they would still make the playoff. But it seems to me that barring that scenario, it should be the four conference champions that will all go if they all have no losses or just one loss. And you got to think to get into those games with such a small schedule, those teams that are playing in those games probably won't have more than one loss to begin with, you know, may, you know, maybe two, I don't know, but uh, yeah, it, it particularly, you know, in the big 12 where they just take the top two teams or whatever. So um, I think it's going to be interesting to see how it all shakes out. And uh, you know, if there is an upset, maybe there's still a spot for somebody who, who basically deserves to be in the playoff, but didn't win the conference championship, but um, I think we're in for a heck of a run in each of these conferences that are playing uh, for these championships. And then you've got, you know, teams like Cincinnati, Central Florida, you know, Central Florida has got a big game this week with Georgia tech who already won a big game. If, you know, they run the table, do they have a, an argument this year? I, I don't know. So I guess we'll, we'll wait and see. I know one of the guys on ESPN before the big 10 was in, I think it was Desmond Howard, I think, had Cincinnati in his final four. So, um, you know, whatever that means. But um, I don't know. It's just, uh, to me, it's like it's like a ray of sunshine. You know, it's like, it's like this year has been so terrible in so many ways, uh, medical, medically-wise, you know, socially, everything just has gone uh, completely kaput. And yet, you know, we finally have something to, to rally around, I guess, here in October. Um, I, I want to go back to a question that Texas or Bust asked about uh, the number of games played for being in the, in the college football playoff. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that the Pac-12 talking about trying to be back by Halloween. And, if, you know, if the Big Ten is going to be able to do eight plus one within that window, and the Pac-12 comes back a week beyond that, they would only be able to do eight, whether that's seven plus one or eight. What is the number that the college football playoff committee is going to be looking at in terms of what do you have to do to be qualified? And 2020, yo, I mean, it's just a weird year. 
where it's, it's not, you know, whatever the bylaws say doesn't really matter at this point. You, we've already seen games in the Big 12, uh, TCU, SMU get postponed. There, there are going to be interruptions. So teams that are supposed to play 10 may only end up playing nine or eight. Teams that are supposed to play eight may play seven. You know, what are your thoughts on what the numbers are going to be? And we also kind of had heard about from Gene Smith about the looks test really kind of entering the equation this year. I think that's what it's going to be. It's going to be the uh, the, the look test and your quality wins. And uh, the, the, I guess that should probably be the top two things because I don't care about Clemson's win against the Citadel, giving them one more data point than Stanford, you know, only playing seven or eight games. So I think the look test will be big and then your quality wins. And we talked about it a week or two ago, a couple weeks ago here, like your season is basically judged on your top four games or whatever, because nobody really has more than four or five tough games. And so if the PAC 12 has all all of their tough games and they're not playing some crappy non-conference teams, like other conferences are, then, you know, maybe they can get in there. I, it'll be tough. And, I had somebody I was on a radio show in Oklahoma City this week and they said, you know, what are the what are your chances? What are the chances? What do you think the chances are that the Big Ten plays every single game this year, given the strict restrictions? And I said five percent. I don't know, because no matter how disciplined Ohio State is, it's not necessarily Ohio State that's going to cost Ohio State a game. Uh, you you can and I told him like every conference has those teams that or commit the most penalties or commit stupid penalties at bad in bad situations. And I'm like, it may not be Ohio state, the cost Ohio state game. It would be. And as Kevin just posted here in our little secret chat, uh, Sparty, you know, it's going to be like the Michigan state that costs somebody a game. And the fact that we're both on the same wavelength with that, it's like the, I think the less disciplined teams could uh, cost disciplined teams a game here or there i think uh oh there goes the pounding again um you know a team opens up zero and four you know are their guys going to stray off you know and go get infected somehow you know are they going to not care and get out of having to play a game because of that you know that's possible i don't think anybody's actually openly actively looking to catch this virus. I had a friend who thinks that he had it a few weeks ago, said it was the worst thing he's ever dealt with in his life. So, uh, and he's about my age, early fifties and, and um, seemingly has come out of it, whatever it was. Uh, I never heard back from him with whether he tested positive or not, but uh, to me, uh, yeah, you do kind of raise that question that, you know, what's the motivation going to be for some of these teams if they get into this and they're, one and five or whatever. And um, as far as how many games they're going to accept for an entrant, I I think you have to keep that open. And I think, uh, you know, is, is, is PAC 12 playing seven in a championship game enough? I guess if they have a team that deserves to be in the final four, it is. So that's going to be the litmus test to me when I'm, when does it walk like a duck and quack like a duck, then it's a duck in an Oregon duck. In this case, uh, could they be a, a, a playoff contender if, if they look like they deserve to be one of the top four teams, regardless of the number of games that they played? I don't want to hear the national talking heads coming on their shows and saying, uh, well, you know, they dragged their feet until October and didn't play. We got to hold that against them. Uh, I don't want to hear that, uh, that, that, again, this is an extraordinary situation in 2020 is, is just Kevin said 2020, yo. So, you know, just chalk it up to, to it being an extraordinary situation. Yeah. I mean, it, and we are going to hear it from the national talking heads because we heard all about it from the national talking heads about, you know, big 10 good for, you know, not playing, but everybody else good for playing. So it just doesn't really seem that there's, any uniformity and you know i certainly am expecting some talk radio shows around major programs within other conferences saying oh we need to keep the big 10 out because you know what the the sec was poised with just three power conferences playing 
to get that second team in there. And, you know, there, there certainly are financial considerations or whatnot. And uh, I, I heard an interview with, with uh, SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey uh, this week after the Big Ten announced its intentions to return. And, you know, he totally no-sold it. And it was like, well, I wish them, I wish them the best in their further endeavors. I mean, you know, there's, they're, they're probably a little salty right now about it because, for, to their credit, they were able to hold tight and go through this the right way. And the Big Ten deviated off the path and was lost in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and has found its way back. But, you know, nothing, nothing is for certain. Yeah. And I, I'm the Gary Danielson is already getting the whiteboards ready for when CBS is back on the air and there's any like kind of contention of a, of a big 10 team making the the playoffs where he'll have they've only played seven games look at these seven and he'll be writing it down and his tears will be like kind of getting in the way of of the, the marker and he's you know now, now things are all smeared and so it, it'll be a mess for him but he's certainly going to try uh, I saw somebody in the chat mention uh, the testing the testing will be once once they get to September third and the antigen and all of that is st stuff is on hand they'll be testing every day although. Um, Dr. Jim Borchers said that they could just move to a six day thing and not test after the day after the game, because there's no, there's no um, impact on uh, them missing something because they would just catch it on, on the next day. So they may just be testing six days a week, getting those results back in 15 minutes. Uh, if there is a positive test, they retest to make sure it wasn't a false positive. And then that 21 days, Kevin, we should probably explain why that is because I know people see that and you're like, well, why is it 21 days when everybody else is told 10 days? And basically it's, it's two weeks for a, a positive test. And then they want, they want somebody who's been sick to have an extra week off to reacclimate and to get back in shape before they're just thrown right back out there. So that's where the, the 15 to 21 days comes in. And uh, it's, it's incentive enough not to hang out or get sick because you immediately miss at the very least three games. And imagine, you know, we go back to Justin Fields saying it's not a, a sacrifice. This is the quarterback of Ohio State who could own the campus if he wants. Can you imagine Terrell Pryor saying it's not a sacrifice? Oh, my God. This is a sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and, you know, to the timeline, I certainly have heard and even seen in the chat about – 21 days being excessive and I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing there but having the week to re you know to onboard back up to competition level or, or whatnot and also to monitor about the myocarditis as well and you know if, if you if you show signs of that or whatnot through extensive testing you're dq'd for the season at that point so i mean a lot of a lot of pieces in motion and i'm sure that there were just a lot of discussions that were had amongst the chancellors and presidents about what you know what the best path was to get everybody back but you know in, in talking about the the chancellors and presidents and probably what needed to be negotiated and agreed upon to get to this point fans in the stands there are not being any maybe some families of the players or whatnot but um you know you sit there and you look at a, a state like nebraska which is getting ready to go into stage four which would have allowed 50 percent capacity maybe there at memorial stadium them being told no fans at this point, you know, the same as, you know, maybe in one of the hotter spots, you know, I'm not keeping track of the States anymore, but it's, I mean, certainly is it's great to have football back, but there won't be the fans in attendance. You know, I saw, um, this is a little bit off topic. The Missouri high school is allowed football, but St. Louis is not. So it, it, the, the, the sense of um, just allowing football, allowing people in the stands, it seems like this the, the Big Ten, the presidents had to kind of just agree. Like some presidents probably didn't want anybody in the stands, and, and so the the presidents who were more comfortable with having people in were like, fine, if, if, if it just gives us football, we'll just keep it to family members of players and staff. And uh, it, it's going to be odd to see an uh, Ohio Stadium that can hold 105,000 having, I don't know, 500 I, I, what's the number going to be you know uh, maybe maybe a thousand tops and uh that poor press box only having like 30 members in it I, it just it breaks my heart see you guys there i hope 
Yeah, I hope. Yeah, too. I wondered about going on the road. If you can't interview players when the game's over, uh, why would you even bother going on the road? You know, and spending the money and the time to travel to a lot of these places, other than to say you were there. I, I don't know what you really gain if everything's going to be done by a Zoom message after a Zoom call after the game. So, um, yeah, I mean, hopefully it doesn't impact our coverage of the of the team too much. Uh, but, um, you know, a lot of things to think about, I guess. And, and it's much bigger than, you know, the, they need to preserve the season. That's the uh, first goal that they have. So uh, worrying about whether, you know, you or I make it to these games is probably far down their list. Not mine. Not <laughs> mine i trust me if you leave me at home and tell me to cover the game and there's a refrigerator full of beer and queso yeah i you know my my staff better be ready because i'm i'll probably be asleep by the third quarter yeah Um, one other point i kind of wanted to bring up is we talked about fans in attendance or not in attendance and families there won't be recruits in attendance either because the dead period has been extended through the end of the year so we now have a dead period that moves beyond the early signing window. So it really creates a lot of questions. And I mean, as we sit here in what, mid September right now, I don't, I mean, yeah, sure. They could just up and say, we're not going to have an early signing period. We're just going to have everybody go in February, but they haven't done that yet. Uh, Very unprecedented times for that. And as you look at an Ohio state class that, most of the way full at this point. There are a lot of other programs who aren't there and are not being able to get out to evaluate these kids either in the high school setting, in person or whatnot, or to even be able to bring the kids on campus to really get to know them more so than just a Zoom call like we're having right now, more or less. I don't understand why coaches can't go and watch players in person right now when everybody else can. Now, granted, you – not everybody else can because you can't just walk up and get tickets to most places. But I, I have been to games, but coaches can't go to games. To me, that's stupid. And you don't need to bump into players. You don't need to do this or do that. You can simply go and, and watch somebody and see how they do it and not talk to anybody. I mean, most everybody does that who goes and, and watches high school football. I, I wonder, like, with no – we've seen recruits going to – like setting up their own visits to schools. Um I'm wondering if they those conferences that have um, attendance allowed, will they be buying tickets to watch games, and, and will that be a negative impact for the Big Ten that they can't watch, uh, that they can't have recruits in their stands watching games? Although I don't know what kind of environment you would actually be getting or, or missing from uh, not having recruits watch you play in front of 500 parents. I think it's a preservation thing. I think it's uh, to protect the coaches and their families. They're not traveling. They're not getting on airplanes. They're not going to strange places. Uh, They're not meeting strange people. You know what I mean? And and, and strange is just the word I'm picking. They're just not going to be – they are keeping them within their group, basically, is all it is. And in this time where you have to have safeguards, that makes sense. By the same token, okay, let's say a a very well-meaning quarterback, high school kid, and his mom and dad are entirely well-meaning, and they show up on your campus, and lo and behold, they find out mom and dad's infected. And now they've touched flesh with the coaches, maybe the players, you know, whatever, and now you got a team infected because you had a prospect, you know, who was not in your control, in your control group, injected into your group. And so I think it's it's common sense to me that you you just it's unfortunate, but for now, the contact has to be the Zoom call or the FaceTime on the telephone and not in contact face to face because you just can't afford to. Uh, get a coach infected uh, going to a high school game, you know, and, and I'm not a scientist. I, I know outdoor football games shouldn't be a breeding ground for this virus. I, I know that. I know that's what everyone's going to say to me. But, uh, yeah, it, it just to me, uh, I think it, it's common sense why they're not doing it. Um, 
I don't know whether they'll do the early signing period or not this year. Um, is anything going to change to where you're going to have people on campus after the first of the year? I'm not sure that it is. I, I don't know. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll have to wait and see. As far as uh, the NCAA is not allowing unofficial visits. So that would be where a school sets aside a ticket for a kid and his two parents to come to a game and it's free of charge for them to come to the game. They don't have to pay for the ticket. That's not allowed. Now, what you're describing is setting aside potentially a ticket or them going on the aftermarket and buying their own ticket and coming to the game. I think that would probably be okay, but under no circumstance should those people be in contact directly with coaches at that event. And if that happens, that's a violation, first of all, and it's a safety issue, second of all. So um, I don't want to hear that, that Arkansas, or for lack of a better term, you know, their coaches were meeting with prospects at a game that, you know, 10,000 people got to come to. I don't want to hear that because that puts the season in jeopardy to well, me. In some places it's going to be harder than others to just be able to come off the street and get a ticket when you're dealing with 20% uh, capacity or whatnot. Arkansas, maybe not, but, you know, Alabama or some of these other programs, uh, demand is still going to be great. So, I agree with Steve there in terms of why it is that they're doing this in terms of trying to keep the circle smaller or whatnot. I don't think, though, that it makes it any less difficult to explain to these recruits that, uh, you know, they're just not getting to go through the process. And, you know, you're doing a lot of stuff on either old information visits during your junior season or whatnot, or, you know, you better have a pretty good uh, Zoom presentation. But I want to I want to change subject for a comment that I saw on the super chat about the chances of the Big Ten getting two teams in the in the college football playoff. You know, earlier we talked about when it was just three conferences, SEC probably licking its chops, thinking it was going to get two in. Now you got four power conferences. I mean, the uh, Notre Dame is put into the ACC uh, column now at this point. Could the Big Ten, with its with its later start, and it was well thought of in the original AP poll in terms of ranked teams, could you see a a nine and zero and an eight and one team emerge and really be be there in that conversation when that final game's the nineteenth and they have to announce the field, what sixteen hours later? Yeah, I, I don't know. Just based on what we've seen from the Big Twelve, it's hard to imagine anybody beating Oklahoma right now. But, you know, maybe we'll see if, um, you know, Texas or Oklahoma State, who we haven't seen yet, can do it. Like somebody out of these conferences is going to have to fall out. I don't expect it to be Clemson. Um, and and if, if, if Oklahoma or a Big 12 team is in there and Ohio State team is in there, I like I don't expect the SEC to be shut out either, even though um, maybe they have the, the toughest road and they may have more losses. But as we know, a loss in the SEC is the same as a win in the Big 12. So you don't necessarily get punished for losing to Alabama or Georgia. You get credit for a good job. You know, you guys almost you guys almost won. That's pretty close to a win. And so it's it's the the SEC gets judged a little bit differently on on, on their wins and losses. Uh, who would the second Big 10 team be then? Would it be the, the West Division? Would it be if, if the if, say it's Wisconsin, if they beat Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship game and Ohio State is undefeated, do both teams go in? Or uh, if they both go into this game undefeated, do both teams go in regardless of who wins? I, I think that's pretty much what it would come down to unless it's Penn State being um, or Ohio State just having the one loss to each other and then the other the other Penn State or Ohio State wins the, the conference. I, I think that's probably the only way. Uh, but I – uh, it seems like this year, they, as he was saying, like they might just try to make it one from each conference this year, just because it's, it's nice and easy that way. But of course, the conferences have to also then uh, do their part to make themselves look viable for a playoff spot. I think that if it's done as it's done in past years, the committee will give us a top ten in those last several weeks, so it should be readily apparent going in to the championship game weekend that Friday, if there is a game on Friday and then Saturday, it should be readily apparent who's in position to make the playoff, 
if this happens, then this happens. You know, if if Texas upsets Oklahoma, then Penn State's got a chance type thing, which, you know, we, we generally know that going into the championship weekend. Um, it was like uh, the year they played Wisconsin. What was it? All these years run together. 2017, I was standing outside Lucas Oil Stadium, and here Wisconsin was undefeated. They were 12-0. and and you would think a win over a 12 and 0 team would put you in the playoff. And I said to Jared Smalley from Channel 4, we were doing a hit on his sports right before the game. And I said, the only thing that would keep him out if they won is if they turned it over two or three times and didn't look good winning. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. JT Barrett threw a bad pick or two. And what? They scraped out of there with like a six point win, like 27 21 or something. And, and, I think they dropped them all the way to six. I mean, it was just right. – they got no credit for beating a 12-0 and team and won the conference championship. Now, obviously, early in the year they had the – what was that? Was the Purdue year, I think, where they got – or was that the Iowa year? Maybe that was the Iowa year. I don't know. They, as I say, they Iowa. all went together. That was the Iowa, Iowa year where they got uh, completely railed at Iowa. But, you know, um, I don't know. I, I think – in this year with such a small sample size with only an eight, nine, ten game season, uh, I don't know that one blowout loss is going to be a disqualifier or, you know, it, it might be. I don't know, but it just seems like you got, you're going to get forgiveness, I think, if you have a, a bad loss perhaps because everyone, as Kevin very adroitly put it, 2020, yo, you know, just it's – the year where crap happens. So, well, and I did forget the, the because it's brand new. The the second place team in the Big Ten East will have a, an opportunity for the second place team in the Big Ten West to get another quality win. So, yes, yeah, that that part isn't even into my brain yet. That that aspect of the the another qualifier there. I, I kind of want to wrap up this hour here by bringing up something that we were all talking about before the world really went crazy. And that was the little tete-a-tete between uh, Ryan Day and Jim Harbaugh and the, the belief of hang a hundred on, uh, on them, you know, better watch out. It's, it's, it's great that we can now talk about stuff like that, but it's also going to be really interesting as you saw all these teams having to try and come together to fight a unified front, now going back to their own, you know, their own worlds and, you know, friendship is all well and good, but, you know, we're going to have to go out and if, if the looks test is going into this, sorry, but we're going to have to hang half a hundred on you. Yep. Yeah. And I think um, the fight for football put all the other stuff in its proper perspective that it was not, I mean, yeah, we all argue and fuss and fight at these different schools and everything, but, we did come together for a common purpose, which was to save the sport and to save the season. And so maybe there'll be, I would say a lessening of hostilities, but it'll be compartmentalized in a way that it's, you know, a healthier thing as opposed to a, uh, it'll be put in the, in a proper perspective, I would say. And, and I think that uh, if there was a rift between Ryan Day and Jim Harbaugh, I don't think it has any kind of an enduring thing um, other than it's just the rivalry between those two schools and it, it's going to burn hot regardless. And, um, you know, I don't know what his major misgiving was. There seemed to have been a photo taken with uh, Al Washington, maybe with a tackling dummy out on a practice field or something. And that indicated that they were doing something that they weren't supposed to be doing. Uh, during that summer period, but coaches were allowed to be out on the field. Um, I guess they couldn't do drills. I, I don't know. I don't know what was legal and what wasn't legal, but you know, you know, you take care of you and I'll take care of me is kind of my feeling on that. Well, it's hard to judge what's going on with just one photo, one snap. And yeah. Uh, but Steve, you mentioned that you know, the, the rift doesn't need to last. I mean, it's been a long time since that happened and, and things can be mended. It's also a long time before the game gets played, so there's plenty more time to create more riffs and create more drama, and uh, I certainly look forward to that. And the thing is, like, this may have been the first time we got to talk to Ryan Day since any of that, and that wasn't even brought up because there's just so much other stuff. It's like we're almost to the point where we can now start talking to football players and coaches about football, and uh, 
that's uh, I'm happy for that. Yeah, I think we're all really happy that we're at that point. So, um, you know, I, I think we're going to call it a show at this point. I want to thank uh, Tony Gerdeman. I'm, I'm not used to being in the host position on this side of a Buckeye scoop and, and Steve Hellwagon, a Buckeye uh, or a Bucknuts on, on my other side. And I'm, I'm Kevin Noon from uh, Buckeye Grove. Great job, Kev. Um, Good job, Kevin. And something about clicking a bell so you know when the show's on and be sure to like and, 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 and share the video and get it out there. And I promise if I have to sit in this chair again next week, I'll do a better job. But I, for, for Tony and Steve, I'm Kevin. I want to thank everybody for joining us.